I oh. am here with Richard Fine via Skype. Richard, I want to thank you for being a guest. No, my pleasure, Larry. <laughs> You have had an extremely impressive uh, career as an attorney. Richard, you've given me a detailed um, CV, which I'm going to make available in the description part of this video. Richard, just to summarize, I know you can't do justice in a minute or so. Why don't you just give us the highlights and what you're really proud of that you've accomplished? I went to the University of Wisconsin. I got lucky and got into the University of Chicago Law School from there. Uh, Professor Soya Menchikoff wrote a letter to the London School of Economics and I was accepted in an LLM program with dissertation. I wrote a PhD on international comparative antitrust law. I was in the universities for 10 years from the time I started in 1957 until I ended up with a PhD in 1967. Straight on. Being a Midwestern boy, I had to take advantage of everything. So in the off times, I went to the International Faculty for Comparative Law in Luxembourg and received a certificate there, two certificates from the Hague Academy of International Law and Public and Private International Law, and a higher diploma from the International Faculty for the Teaching of Comparative Law in Strasbourg, where I attended uh, sessions in Strasbourg, Paris, um, Bratislava, Cagliari, and Coimbra, Portugal, Good. and so forth, and went to school with the best professors in the world. And they came from all over the world. So I learned my Russian law from Kutogolov, a Russian professor. I learned my French law from Rene David, the professor in Paris, and all of these different things. So I had opportunities that probably are not available anymore. For after four years at the Justice Department, I ended up going up with a private firm in Los Angeles. I was there for a year and then I was asked by the new mayor, Mayor Bradley, to go after the old mayor for corruption. Wow. Uh, so I became the special counsel to the Government Efficiency Committee. I knocked off Samiorty for corruption and started the first um, municipal antitrust division in the country. Did that for a year and then started my own law firm. And at that point, uh, it became history. Uh, changed the way United Way did business. Uh, I saved and returned to the taxpayers approximately a billion dollars of money that state governments, county governments, and city governments took illegally from trust funds and special funds. And after OPEC, mm -hmm. uh, these were just some of the things uh, changed the way that the manufacturers paid independent uh, servicers in California because the state wasn't enforcing the law, was involved in the first terrorist bombing of an airport or shooting at an airport. So you, these are the types of cases that I had. But you stopped 26 years of budget crises. Yes. Uh, I, happened, that made people happy. The, the legislators were really happy with you after that, right? Tell us about that. Yeah, they, what occurred is for 26 years, California had budget crises in that the Democrats and the Republicans couldn't get along so in making a budget. So what they did is they would have a crisis, but the effect of the crisis would be that they stopped the payments to counties for welfare and other things like that. They stopped all the payments to the minority businesses. They stopped the payments to the state employees, but the employees would get paid their back pay later, so the employees really weren't hurt that badly. Well, I came in in 1998 on behalf of the Howard Jarvis Taxpayers Association and a man by the name of Stephen White. And I got an injunction, caught the right judge. <laughs> and, uh, and I got a, got a temporary restraining order and a preliminary injunction. And the next day, the state legislature passed an emergency bill for $13 billion. Right. And suddenly, the people got paid, and five years later, they won the case in the California Supreme Court. Richard, at one point, you discovered that Cali the California judges were receiving bribes. Tell us how you stumbled upon that information and what you did in response and where it led you. 
I found that back in the year two, this all happened, mind you, from 1998 to 1999 and into 2000. In 2000, the Chief Justice of the California Supreme Court gave a speech to the California Judges Association in San Diego. And he talked about the fact that the L.A. County judges should be paying for everyone's lunches because of the fact that they were getting all this money. And he said, the money may be unconstitutional. And I picked up on that. Sure. So it was reported in the newspaper. Right. And that's how I really found out. And then I went into the Court of Appeal on my briefs, and I said, wait a minute. Well, this is illegal money here. And I quoted him and everything, and that's when the judges started going berserk. And sure. then, then they started hitting me, and uh, they came after me, and they stopped a lot of money that I had earned from 1996 onwards for winning class action cases. And then they came after me in 2003 to try and disbar me. And then the uh, state bar came in and said, whoops. You know, this was a fraud because the real reason we dis he got disbarred is because he caught the judges on the illegal payments. We ended up with five motions to remove the disbarment based upon fraud upon the court. The state bar did not oppose any of those motions. There's a rule that says if the motion is not opposed, it may be deemed to be granted. They may be deemed that they consented to the granting of the motion. The California Supreme Court did nothing about that and refused to remove the disbarment. And that's where we stand today. It still sits. So, it still sits. But the interesting thing, in the United States Supreme Court, I am still avail allowed to practice. So let's just summarize and unpack some of this. But the important thing is that you found out about these bribes it was reported in the paper and you were the only one richard who took action and actually brought it up in a lawsuit and you've never done anything unethical but what they did was they disbarred you and the judges stopped all these payments because you were in fact a judicial whistleblower isn't that right yeah more than that not only a judicial whistleblower, but in fact, in law, in various lawsuits, I challenged the judges because what happened in 2008 in a case called Sturgeon versus the County of Los Angeles, they effectively copied one of the lawsuits that I brought in 2002, and they won. And so, consequently, what took place is that the judges then went to the legislature and they got a statute passed called SBX 211 that allowed the judges to keep getting paid the same amount of money that they were paid on July 1st, 2008. But the more important part is, is that the judges were given retroactive immunity from criminal prosecution, civil liability and disciplinary action for having received that money and the counties and the county employees who gave them the money were given the same retroactive immunity. So the judges went in and did something that I could never do. They got themselves immunity from criminal prosecution. So they got themselves named as criminals. Well, really, when you say what they did, what you mean is the government stood up to protect judges who the prosecutors knew that because of these legislative payments that happened at a municipal level, they were all these parties were complicit in a crime, correct? Well, it, was e it was even worse because I never accused them of being, I never said they were criminals. I set up all the statutes that I mentioned all the statutes that were involved, but what they and did, criminal statutes, right? <laughs> they were criminal statutes. Sure. Yes. But what they did is they what it is specifically got immunity from the criminal, from the state criminal statutes. They never got immunity from the federal criminal statutes, but the feds never went after them. So they took that step to protect themselves and got themselves named as criminals by going after that immunity because under the California Constitution, 
they were guilty of misconduct in office, which was an impeachable defense. And impeachable could, offense, right. And they could be impeached by the California legislature for having engaged in that misconduct. So they basically needed that immunity in order to stay in office. So, Richard, these laws were getting passed because they were hiding these bribes and these payments, but you're in the state of California. It's happening in one of the largest counties, and really the only person who's standing up and speaking up about this by filing documents and raising it in court proceedings is you, right? That's correct. But the interesting thing is, as a lawyer, you take an oath to uphold the Constitution. As a California lawyer, you take an oath to uphold the Constitution of the United States and the state of California. Every lawyer takes that oath. So effectively, I was following the oath. That no one else was following. No one else was following. As a judge, they take the same oath. They were not following it. And then you have all the codes of conduct, and one of the codes of conduct, or California Code of, e- Code of Ethics, is Canon Number 4D1, which says you shall not take a payment from anyone who's in front of you or likely to become a party in front of you. So they not only are breaking the oath, but they're also breaking Canon 4D1 of the Code of Ethics. And that brought you to Judge Jaffe. Could you tell us about that? Judge uh, David P. Yaffe. Yaffe. Yeah. yeah. And interestingly enough, what occurred is that I had a suit. I was involved in an area called Marina del Rey. Now, I had a number of suits in Marina del Rey where what had happened is that the county of Los Angeles had ended up leasing land to developers. The developers were making $360 million a year on the apartments that they had on this leased land. And they had 60-year leases from the county. The county was making $35 million a year, only 10%. The public lost approximately a billion dollars in money that they should have gotten from the developers. So the County Board of Supervisors really screwed the taxpayers on this. And I brought the cases to get that money back. So I sued the county and the developers. I then filed the lawsuit and I showed that this happened. Now the county was paying the judges. It comes up in front of good old David P. Yaffe. We don't have any hearings in front of Yaffe. The county and Epstein file for a dismissal. I counter that, and I file for a win, a default, because they don't do anything. In the meantime, the state bar comes in during the midst of this and ends up putting me on an involuntary suspension while the state bar case is going on. So I'm now out of the case. Somebody else comes in and substitutes, Yaffe goes in and uh, allows the case to go forward based upon what I have done and ends up charging me, setting a, a judgment against me to pay the other side's attorney's fees, which he can't do under the law. And as far as my motion is concerned, he says, no harm, no foul. And right. allows the county to go. Okay. Months pass, and this happened October 17th, 2017. I mean, sorry, 2007. January 2008 comes in, Yaffe makes that decision, and now I'm in this case personally. I come in and I say, Yaffe, you can't do this because A, it's unconstitutional, and B, there's no notice, and C, you're on the take. <laughs> right. <laughs> so so I, I go in there and I disqualify Yaffe. Yaffe comes in and says, you know, that you can't do, that you don't have the right to do this. And I say, oh, yes, I do. I disqualify him. Yaffe doesn't answer for 10 days. Under the law, 
he is automatically disqualified from the case because the law says that if you disqualify and you don't answer within 10 days, you have accepted the disqualification. In section 170.1C4, 170.3C4, bang, you're gone. You're no longer the judge. Yaffe stays on the case. And he then enters a judgment against me, an illegal judgment for $45,000. They then try and do and enforce it, and they ask for my financials. I say, you can't do it. Yaffe isn't the judge. We then end up with a contempt proceeding. In the contempt proceeding, I put Yaffe on the stand. Now, Yaffe admits that he's taking the money at this point. I put him on the stand. Yaffe is now the judge and the witness. Judging himself, and I get him to admit everything. Because he doesn't have a choice. He figures, why make it worse by lying about it? He's, yes. he's better off just getting away with a crime that the rest of the county, all the other exactly. county judges, are also guilty of. So the next thing that happens is he holds me in contempt. And in the contempt order, he ends up saying that I should have caught him in the beginning instead of his acting responsibly, which he has to do under the law, and admit that he was taking the money and recuse himself. That's actually in his contempt order. And he throws me in jail for 18 months. Now, 14 months in, he comes in and he says, whoops, I made a mistake in this one order that I made where I said that fine couldn't do this. You know, that was an error. So now, 14 months and he says that, and then what takes place is that he then, four months later, a very interesting thing happens. And that is, I'm Jewish, and we're on the eve of Kol Nidre evening, which is the day before the Day of Atonement. It's the day before the Day of Atonement. And Hasidic rabbis come in, and we're in the jail, you know, we're singing songs and doing all these things. The trustees are watching. They want to convert into Judaism so they can have this happening. <laughs> the next day is Kol Nidre evening. I'm in my cell, and the guard comes in, and he starts rousting the cell. Now, he's never done this before. I mean, it's just... Uh, what, like searching, messing stuff up, you mean? What's messing the... stuff up and everything else. And I said to him, I said, you know, what are you doing? And he said, I'm rousting the cell, lie down on the bed and everything. And I said, you know, God's going to get you for this. And he keeps doing this and everything. And then he comes back and he says, you're out. So what, said, what was he doing? A joke? Was it like, do you mean like him? he was doing that as said, a joke because he knew he was going to release you? No, he didn't know it at the time. And he... Um, he came back. He said, you're out. I said, that's worse than you're rousting the cell. He said, no. He says, it's true. He said, so he actually was there to harass you and punish you. But in fact, the order came and he had to release he, you. He might have known it, but he said, this is it. He said, you're out. He said, it's all over. And there was Yaffe's order letting me out on Kol Nidre Eve. But that, and, was a, that was because a rabbi interceded for you, well, right? Rabbi said they were going to talk to the judge. I mean, who knows if they did or if they didn't or if God talked to the judge. Strong coincidence, though, right, Richard? That's a, it's that day. They may that, have. That day is when it happened. Right. And right. the guard you know, got the trustees together because I had, in 18 months, I had all these, I had been doing all my briefs from the cell because I was in solitary coercive confinement. Lights were on 24 hours a day. It was cold in there. When it rained, it leaked into the cell. I mean, one person wrote a piece, I think it was in the American Thinker, saying that my confinement was worse than what was happening in Guantanamo Bay. So, because, Richard, was, were any of the guards, did any of them know you? Were they nice to you? Or how were you treated? Well, the jail is a country unto itself. I mean, what happened is that the sergeant who was taking care of everything, his wife knew about me and told the sergeant, you better make sure this guy is okay. Yeah. And he was the sergeant that was in charge of the area in which I was in. They, they put me in a hospital area. Um, and I had a cell. You know, I had a private cell, being in solitary course of confinement. Sure. 
Now, before that, they did various things to break me. The first thing that they did is they decided to throw me in suicide watch. Now, there was no suicide problem, but this is a type of thing that they'll do to try and break you. So you end up where they take away all your clothing, they take away all your food utensils and everything else. And I'm in there, I was in there for about a two-week period of time until finally they sent me to a psychologist who looked at me and said, this is crazy. You're not supposed to be here. So let's, so let's talk about, about how they're trying to break you. What you're talking about is it sounds like word came in from Yaffe that we had to get you. What were they really trying to coerce, coerce you into doing? Giving they, up your complaint against the judges? Like What, what, what did they were, you know? They were trying to coerce me to basically give up and turn over my financials so that they could enforce this illegal judgment against me okay and i was saying no this judgment is illegal yaffe is illegal and i'm not going to give in now the interesting thing let's get this to a conclusion real quick richard did you ever give up those assets did they ever take that money away no i never gave up the assets you know they never took the money away you know and they got nowhere with it except where Yaffe got a tremendous big black eye. The California judicial system got a black eye. Because this was publicized ultimately. Yeah, it was publicized. Uh, PBS came in. PBS did uh, interviews. CNN uh, did interviews. A Wesley Dutton of the Full Disclosure Network uh, did a lot of interviews. Uh, when I, the main... The L.A. Times uh, did a, maybe one interview, but their, their interviews were very biased. They were all in favor of the judges. So in the end, when I got out and they called me to interview me, I said, no, I'm not talking to you guys. Right, so they, right. wrote, they wrote a story saying that I didn't talk to them. You know, and they just, they just wrote uh, their story. The Valley newspaper did, uh, did interviews, but the hatred of the judges is so great because they got caught out so badly from because of what you did right richard because of, what, because of what i did because in the end what took place is california had approximately 1800 superior court judges 90 percent of them had taken illegal payments from the counties. And superior court means trial court judges, right? Yes, it's trial court judges. But a number of those trial court judges that had taken those payments ended up on the Court of Appeals. So you had a number of Court of Appeals judges taking those payments. And four out of the seven California Supreme Court justices had taken those illegal payments during the time that they were superior court judges, including, no, including no. four out Four out of seven of the California Supreme Court just, justices, including Ronald M. George, the chief justice of the California Supreme Court, who, after Yaffe retired, himself then retired, and then an associate justice about a year later, Moreno, who also had taken illegal payments when he was a California uh, Los Angeles Superior Court judge retired. Richard, there's one other thing I want to point out. This isn't just judges getting a raise. It had measurable injustices come from the fact that then the judges were predisposed to benefiting county government and elected officials privately because of their donations and their business interests against the general public. It was not a harmless thing that they were doing, correct? Right. Absolutely. Let me tell you how extensive it was. Every criminal case was tainted. Because remember, the district attorney is a county employee. So every criminal case that came in, let's take Los Angeles County, from 1985 when these payments began, all the way through until you had SBX 211 saying that the payments could continue on the same terms and conditions as they existed on July 1st, 2008. All criminal cases were tainted. Every case of eminent domain 
was tainted. Every case against the county for personal injury was tainted. Every case in which the county could have an interest with respect to the sale of property, to take uh, domestic cases, you know, divorce cases where property is going to get sold and everything, and the county could have an interest in getting higher taxes, was tainted. Every child custody case was tainted. Where the state's a party. Where the yeah. county's a party. Right. Where the county's a party. Every welfare case right. is tainted. Right. So literally, the entire, almost the entire justice system is tainted. The only cases that were not tainted by these payments would be cases between private individuals where the county had absolutely no possible interest, and that's very few cases. And Richard, let's 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 define our terms. And you say tainted. Does that mean that they could be retroactively opened by the aggrieved party? Absolutely. And so now, let me bring you into the situation. The attorney generals at that time did nothing about reopening these cases after the Sturgeon case. The California the Sturgeon case now. So that what, is what specifically. South which said that the case, that the payments were unconstitutional. Right. The uh, California Supreme Court, which should have done something about reopening the cases, recognizing all of this, did nothing because naturally, four out of the seven of the judges, you know, had received the illegal payments. They weren't going to be doing anything about it. The United States Department of Justice, denial of due process, did nothing to go in and do the investigation to reopen these cases. Nobody did anything. And this is a massive, massive tragedy. And it wouldn't be that hard to do it through, just like dealing with a class action case. You just reopen the cases and you go through and you deal with them. Sure. So Richard, did you ever think of giving up when you were in, incarcerated and basically they were trying to coerce you to get that 45 grand you know, did, did it ever seem hopeless? Tell us about what you went through and your thought process during that time. Well, the uh, no, I, I never thought of giving up because in the first instance, I thought that what would happen is I might be in jail for five days or so. Because normally on a contempt, you end up in, for five days and you're out. And you know, five days is like easy. It takes a couple of days for them to process you. And then you got two more days and you're gone. You know, so it's uh, well, it didn't work out that way. No, I mean, they 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 were really in there to get me. And the other part of it is that I came in. Now I filed when this happened. I immediately set up to file writs of habeas corpus. So we had the federal. I had the federal thing going. There was no attorney that would represent me. I went to Judicial Watch, who did the Sturgeon case. They said no. I went to uh, the ACLU. They said no. I went to all the major organizations, and everyone said no. They weren't about to touch this because they really want to be friendly with the judges for their own cases. Sure, it's a reflection of how much power the judges truly have in our country, isn't well, it, Richard? It's, it isn't, you know, and I look at it this way. The judges only have power if people are willing to give them the power. If people like the ACLU and some of these other organizations would stand up to the judges, the judges wouldn't have the power. But it's almost a situation that people have power if other people are willing to succumb. Thanks for watching. Stay tuned for part two of the interview with Richard Fine, where he discusses how to fight judicial corruption.